Welcome back to the Oncology Brothers podcast. I'm Rahul Gosain, and as always, joined by my brother and co-host, Rohit Gosain. Today, we are thrilled to have Dr. Pitros Grievous from Fred Hutch Cancer Center to discuss some key GU malignancy highlights from ESMO 2024. Pitros, welcome. ESMO was exciting to say the least. Hi, guys. Very excited to be here. ESMO was super exciting, as you said. A lot of important data, very interesting discussions, presentations, orals and posters. So definitely a very important meeting. And I have to say that for a second year in a row, I think GU cancers were probably <laughs> one of the most prominent uh, you know, cancer types in terms of new data. Uh, and we had the back-to-back, -back, uh, we had uh, another presidential symposium uh, with two GU uh, uh, abstract. So I'm very excited to see the progress made in the field and the positive impact in patients' outcomes. And the well, Petros, welcome. Petros, we have four important abstracts to cover today. And as you stated, GU certainly took the center stage and Dr. Powell's continued to hit home run after home run with these practice changing studies. And that's exactly the first study we'll talk about from him. That is Niagara study in bladder cancer space. And then we'll dive into renal, san renal cell cancer with Tinivo 2. And then closing off with two prostate cancer studies, PEACE 3 and an update from Contact 02. Petros, you were in fact the discussant for Niagara trial, which we will be discussing here. Can you walk us through the study design and do, what does it really translate to your clinic today? Great question. And uh, I want to say that Niagara trial was probably uh, one of the most important trials presenting the entire ESMO Congress 2024, really important data and in my opinion, practice changing. So let's look at the trial design. We all know that cisplatin-based neoadjuvant chemotherapy is a standard of care in patients who are fit enough to get cisplatin. Probably between 50 and 60% of patients in our practice are fit enough to get cisplatin based on the GALSI criteria that were published in JCO in 2011. And the goals we have had is, number one, to improve utilization uh, of that uh, approach, and secondly, to build upon that. So Niagara builds upon that backbone. We have GEMSYS as the comparator control arm. Uh, patients got four cycles of GEMSYS in the control arm. And the experimental arm, it was the addition of Durvalumab, PDL1 inhibitor, four doses neoadjuvantly with GEMSYS before radical cystectomy, and then up to eight monthly doses of adjuvant Durvalumab after cystectomy, regardless of pathologic response. So it was kind of a perioperative, you know, sandwich approach. The uh, primary point was pathologic complete response rate, but mainly event-free survival. The, the weight of the alpha was mainly for uh, this event-free survival, and the key secondary point was overall survival. Before I, I talk about the efficacy, I want to show that the toxicity safety data uh, were as expected. And actually, if you look at the tornado plot, the toxicity was very similar in the two arms. So the addition of Durvalumab to GEMCs did not compromise the ability of patients to undergo curative intent radical cystectomy. So that was reassuring that toxicity-wise, uh, the data looked pretty balanced uh, and similar in the two arms. So that's a feasible approach. And we have seen that uh, both in uh, phase two trials in bladder cancer, but also in other tumor types like breast cancer, lung cancer, where chemoimmunotherapy is being used. Efficacy-wise, there was a delta about 10% in the pathologic complete response rates from 27% with GEMSYS to 37% with GEMSYS Durvalumab. The combination uh, GEMSYS Durva uh, had higher path CR rate. You can argue that the path CR rate looks lower compared to what we have seen in other trials. However, there may be many explanations of that. Uh, for example, in the denominator, they included patients uh, who elected to not undergo cystectomy. This was about 6% in each arm that were included in the denominator. Also, you know, if you look at the clinical states, about 40% was T2 and 0, 6% was a higher state, T3 or T4. And there was about 5% of N1 states. Uh, and of course, they allowed patients with GFR below 60 ml per minute. Uh, and about 20% of patients, one out of five, had a lower GFR between 40 and 60. These patients usually were not considered the, uh, fit for cisplatin, but they were included, and they used split dose cisplatin for those patients. And the question is split dose cisplatin. We use it sometimes with borderline creatinine clearance, uh, but we don't have you know prospective data uh, about split dose cisplatin. But it's an approach we take sometimes in clinical practice. 
overall, I would say the important message is that event-free survival and overall survival um, endpoints were met. Uh, there was a hazard ratio of 0.68 for event-free survival, hazard ratio 0.75 for overall, overall survival. Both of them are clinically meaningful. Uh, if you look at the delta at the two-year point, you have that uh, in that slide, you see it's about 7% delta in overall survival. Uh, so you can argue you have to treat maybe you know 13 or so patients for two years to benefit one, but in oncology, that's meaningful. Uh, so uh, it's an important positive trial. It's the only positive trial for OS evaluating checkpoint inhibitor in the neoadjuvant or adjuvant setting. In, the, in this case, it's both neoadjuvant and adjuvant. So I think it's practice changing. Someone can argue that the control arm uh, did not have m much access to adjuvant checkpoint inhibition. The trial Niagara finished accrual before the regulatory approval of adjuvant nivolumab in this setting. So someone can argue what would have happened if the control group got adjuvant nivo. We don't know the answer. And of course, the access to subsequent therapies in metastatic disease, if someone has recurrence, may have impacted, of course, uh, the uh, performance of both uh, uh, arms in terms of overall survival. So uh, subsequent therapies matter. But at the end of the day, the best data set we have right now in this setting uh, in neoadjuvant or adjuvant immunotherapy is the Niagara trial. Uh, data are practice changing in cisplatin eligible patients specifically. Uh, not for cisplatin ineligible patients as a different population. And of course, we're waiting to see the regulatory agency decision and review of this data. Petros, thank you for laying that foundation. This is very, very exciting and impressive. And for a few reasons. About same tolerability when you're checking it with chemotherapy, you have EFS and importantly, you have OS. So patients are living longer. You brought up that this is practice changing. Yes, we'll wait for FDA approval, but today outside clinical trial for the right patient in front of you, would you consider moving forward with this approach in someone that has resectable muscle invasive bladder cancer and are cis eligible? I think it's a great question. Uh, personally, I would uh, definitely consider this in my practice tomorrow. I think the question is whether um, people may want to wait for regulatory approval, uh, which I think it's, uh, it's a reasonable question. I think the data are compelling enough, in my opinion. Now, but the question always becomes is, how much is really IO adding in adjuvant space? Outside of clinical trials, any setting where you would rather let go of I.O. in post-op space, especially when we saw some updates from Ambassador trial at ESMO 2024, which is use of pembrolizumab in adjuvant settings, and you think if CTDNA would guide your treatment here at all? Number one, Niagara trial was great. And again, in my opinion, practice changing for sure. However, the design of the study, you know, six or seven years ago, uh, it, it took a combined neoadjuvant adjuvant kind of a sandwich approach and was not able to tease apart the individual contribution of the neoadjuvant phase or the adjuvant phase. Do we need either? or we need both. And I made this point in my discussion at ESMO. I think based on the design, we have to take the whole packaged approach, I would say, and to discuss with the patients early on, if they can tolerate, of course, to volume up, they can continue in the adjuvant phase, regardless of the pathologic response, path CR or not path CR. And we're going to see more data in the future to help with this dialogue. Do we have to treat everybody? Because obviously, uh, there is a risk of over-treatment here. Uh, and I think we will over-treat patients because we do not have reliable biomarkers to help us answer the question of over-treatment or under-treatment. And what we know for cDNA so far is strongly prognostic. CDNA negative, especially if it stays negative, this portends very good outcomes. So the, the disease-free survival and overall survival, these endpoints look very favorable in patients who are CDNA negative. So it's very prognostic. What we need to find out is whether it's predictive indeed. There is a hypothesis generated in the Invigor 010 trial that we published in Nature a few years ago with Tom Pauls and others. We look at CDNA positive patients post cystectomy, and those patients appear to have benefit with adjuvant atizo versus observation. This is a hypothesis based on a post hoc exploratory analysis, and this is by hypothesis being tested. Petros, thank you so much for starting off off with a bang. Of course, there's a lot going on in bladder cancer.